It's such a pleasure and an honor to open the festival with a conversation with such a distinguished person who is uniquely poised to take us through all of the issues that are so urgent today. Um, because of Professor Goodwin's range of expertise, we're going to be able to talk about a range of really pressing issues here and how the law shapes uh, health in really important ways, whether that's reproductive health or beyond. Um, Michelle is uh, the chancellor's professor at the, U excuse me, she holds the chancellor's chair at the University of California, Irvine, with appointments at the School of Law, Health Sciences, and Department of Gender and Sexuality. So she's truly an interdisciplinary person. We're, we're so thrilled that she was able to squeeze in between, uh, what is it, between the Twin Cities and Korea. And then is where Aspen, that's right. <laughs> is where Aspen falls on her itinerary. Um, so I, I wanna get right into it. Let's Be do that. Because you've, you've studied and you've written about uh, all of the ways that the law shapes health yes. and vice versa. Yes. And so I wonder if we could just start out with this question of patenting genes, uh, because this is part of our, part of our oeuvre here. Um, so That's this, our softball. Yes. We start with a patent. This is the easy one before this we get the into the super controversial stuff. Um, so OK, just to set the stage here, there's currently a bill in Congress that says uh, that you should be able to patent genes, despite the fact that some of you may know that in 2012 and in 2014, the Supreme Court repeatedly ruled that you cannot patent genes. And among the genes that were at issue in those cases were breast cancer uh, mutations, or mutations that, that indicate a tendency towards breast cancer. Um, and yet, this is something that the ACLU, on which you serve on the National Executive Board, has yeah. raised a lot of concerns about. But the Trump administration and a bipartisan group of senators have proposed to overrule that Supreme Court decision. So take us through, what are the issues sure. at stake here? So, so you know, it's tongue in cheek when I say it's not controversial because in this sort of space of our bodies, do we own ourselves, is a question that's been debated for a very long time. I, and in the BRCA case, it was about, you know, the potential to um, have breast cancer discovered in the body, but having to pay a fee to discover what is already in your body. And BRCA is for folks exactly. Who don't know. It's, 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 the it's, it's the mutation, the genetic mutation um, that researchers and doctors uh, look for. But here's what's important to know, which is that this is all part of a struggle that the United States Congress has had for a while, and the Supreme Court. There is a law, the Bayh-Dole Act enacted in the 1980s um, in Congress. And the idea was that the US was behind. The US needed to catch up to Japan, and it needed to patent, 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 right? This is the idea behind it. And then there's this case in 1980, the Shakabardi case, which deals with um, a mutation. Uh, and the question is, can this living kind of mutation be patented? And the Supreme Court decision is a 5-4 decision with, um, I call them the dynamic duo, right? Uh, Brennan and Thurgood Marshall, like Batman and Robin, right? They're on the <laughs> side of, of no, of course not. You can't patent things that are in nature. And when you think about it, Jonas Salk, uh, who discovered the vaccine for polio, and he was asked, well, why didn't you patent this? And he said, would you patent the sun? And so this debate about what's living and what's in nature should it be patentable? And it's a long-standing debate within our courts. Most recently, the court has said no, but you're right. In Congress, they're debating whether that should not be the case, that perhaps we could advance innovation by spurring researchers to do more research that could be patentable. And I'll just add one piece to that. At universities, it used to be publish or perish, and you've probably heard of that. But now, for many, it is patent or perish. And what universities used to do in terms of promoting, these are the number of articles and books that have been published by our researchers. Now, it here's much value, how much value we have derived from patents, right? So that has shifted. And one thing to note with that, because law is behind technology. Technology always outpaces law. And it raises some very significant ethical questions 
at universities. I'll give just one more case and then we can move on. Yeah. Is this case called Moore v. Regents. How many of you have heard of this case? Probably not many people at all. Not well, many. it's a fascinating case because it's a case that involves a guy who has this rare mutation and it's hairy cell leukemia. And his doctors collaborate right away, and they're at the University of California, Los Angeles, and they collaborate right away with a biotech company to patent his cell line. He has no idea about it. And so he's told, come back for more medical treatment, and that medical treatment includes giving his semen, giving up his spleen, giving up human tissue, all of this, and he thinks he's being treated. He thinks he's doing this for treatment. He has no idea that the doctor is collaborating with a biotech company. And what they're trying to do is get a patent derived from his cell line. And it ends up being a patent that's estimated at about $3 billion before he finds out and he sues. So these issues are actually quite controversial, and they are quite timely for us, too. So do you see them in the context of rights issues, of bodily autonomy? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You know, when I present this question to my students today, I mean, that was a case in the 1990s. When I present this question to my students today, they're like, of course I own my body. Of course I do. But what's interesting about Morvey Regents is that he actually loses the case before the California Supreme Court because the justices say, well, of course you can't own your own body. To own your own body is like slavery. People can't own people. I know, right? How absurd does that you sound? You don't own your own body. You, that's according to the court. But there is a split. Because there have been cases that have been at the Federal Circuit Appeals level in the Sixth Circuit, in the Ninth Circuit, and they've come out differently. And in these cases, they've involved the question whether a person is legally entitled to their relative's dead body parts. And I'll just quickly wrap this up. Those involve these cases where there have been state laws that say, well, look, so long as you've not told us no, we presume that you give us permission to take out of your body, right? Now, who would know to register no or know in their state that there are laws such as this? Well, it's happened in Ohio and in California and so forth, and relatives have sued afterwards. And in the Sixth Circuit and in the Ninth Circuit, those courts have said, yes, relatives do actually have an interest in their deceased relative's body, uh, and that this is a constitutional interest that rises to a property right. And so there's a lot that needs to be disentangled in this space. Do you anticipate the Supreme Court going back on its myriad decision? No. no. So they would likely find this law unconstitutional? No, no, I don't. Because when you think about it, the sort of fundamental tenets about humanity were at stake in that particular case. When you think about it, a poor woman who has breast cancer or the potential for breast cancer that's alive in her body, but that she can't actually find this out lest she pay a very significant fee, there's just something that seems untenable and wrong about that. But there's even more to unpack in, in this space, and I think we'll probably get to some of that, which includes you know, questions about fetal remains. When we think about you know, what's our own body, there are also questions about you know, related to our relatives, these issues have come up with regard to Congress, with regard to fetal remains, and even in the Supreme Court very recently. Well, I mean, I can't help but pick up the thread that you just left there. There you go. We're knitting is, up here. Which is that the Supreme Court did, in fact, recently consider an Indiana abortion law yeah. um, that's specifically related to a provision of disposal of fetal remains, that's as right. well as a prohibition on abortion for reason of race, sex, um, and disability. Gender, disability and gender. Right. Um, so talk to me about, so this was a very unusual case procedurally, also the way that the Supreme Court chose to handle it, uh, what we heard, what we didn't hear. So can you take us through, this yes. was just a few weeks ago, you might have heard about Clarence Thomas's dissent in this case, which I'm particularly interested in hearing what you think about right. it. But first, take, take us through the decision. <laughs> Is that a s yes. <laughs> this is a You're permitted. <laughs> Everyone here is entitled to their own opinion. That's right. Uh, OK, so take us through. You have this in, these two Indiana provisions that go before the Supreme Court. Uh, and and this Indiana, uh, the Sixth Circuit has said that they cannot 
enforce these because you can't look at the reasons why someone has an abortion. This, they asked the Supreme Court to hear it, and the Supreme Court does what? Right. So, so this was the this was the, the Seventh Circuit that that the, 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 the seven. right exactly. So, the Supreme Court um, split on these two questions, right? Um, and with regard to the first question, how do you dispose of fetal remains? Can I back up one second before we go there? Uh, and here's why. In Congress, there's been, there wasn't really a controversial question with regard to what you do with fetal remains because Republicans in Congress in the 1990s led the efforts for fetal tissue research. Mitch McConnell, he was leading the way, he was at the forefront. And so were many others um, right there um, saying this is urgently important and in fact so important that there could be financial exchanges such as fees paid so that fetal remains could get to the researchers that need to use them. Now this might sound surprising to some of you because you're like, oh my gosh, that's disconnected from what we've been hearing because at the time, if you think about it, the 1990s, Reagan had been in office, Reagan leaves the office and we know, everybody knows that he had been impaired, right? And Nancy Reagan fights for greater research for Alzheimer's, right? Parkinson's and whatnot. And what do you think is used in that research? Fetal tissue. For more than a century, fetal tissue has been used in research. You think about the vaccines that keep children alive, that keep children with the ability to go outside and play. Polio, how do you think that the vaccine came about? Through research on fetal tissue remains. This everybody knew. And so in the 1990s, Republicans actually led the way, and it was bipartisan, to support an NIH bill that would provide for fetal tissue research and also proper compensation for the transport of this. And I think that that ground, laying the ground for this is really important, and also for us to think about our own trade-offs, right? Because we sit comfortably here in beautiful Aspen and can feel pretty secure if we vaccinated our kids that they're okay. Our kids have grown up. Our kids were able to go outside and play on playgrounds. We didn't have to worry about polio. We didn't have to worry about smallpox. All these things, the trade-off, stop doing that research, and then what happens to our community. So I think that that's an important kind of backdrop. Now to get to, to this recent case, which fits within a um, cornucopia, if you will, of laws that are knitting around abortion. And in this particular law, it related to how will fetal tissue remains be disposed and after an abortion. After an abortion, um, such as can they be cremated? And the very interesting thing is that with the law, a woman could still decide after the abortion to actually have the fetal tissue remains cremated. But Justice Thomas, in a concurrence in this case, um, uh, basically compares the disposal of fetal tissue remains uh, to the sort of throwing out of dirty needles and things like that in a hospital. It's, it's very inflammatory. Um, the second part of the case, Thomas spends a lot of time on, and this is the part of the case where states have also been sort of knitting around abortion, um, you know, sort of wanting to intervene on questions of, well, if a person has a motivation for abortion that's related to disability, is that a legitimate consideration? Is it a constitutional consideration? What about sex and race? These had never been controversial issues before, but it's an issue that uh, has arisen. The Supreme Court in this recent case says, we're not going to touch it. It's not really an issue that's come up in American courts. And they said there's really no case in controversy for us. But Justice Thomas spends a lot of time on this. It's almost like he was writing a law review article. I even wondered, well, was he giving a talk someplace and decided to just like bring this into the case? Because I mean, he goes on and on and on about the history of uh, eugenics. And what he says is that basically we ought to really be concerned about people's motivations for abortion because these could place us back into a time where eugenics uh, is promoted and where eugenics takes place in the United States. Now, 
to put this in context, there are a lot of people that say, like Dorothy Roberts and others, that this is absolutely ridiculous. And in fact, I do in fact think that you know, the concurrence is a bit ridiculous um, here. But to give some context to his concurrence, long before Germany had adopted eugenics, the United States actually had model eugenics laws. Many Americans don't know this. In 1927, the US Supreme Court affirmed one of these laws. It was a Virginia law that provided for the non-consensual sterilization of people who were deemed socially and mentally unfit. And the subject of the case was a girl named Carrie, who was a poor white girl from Virginia. Her mother had been locked up in a colony, what Virginia itself called the colony, where they shuffled off people that they thought were unfit. Carrie was raped by her foster parent's nephew. It's kind of unclear, was she a foster child or was she just their employee? Anyway, she was raped, there was a pregnancy, and there was a, a childbirth. And the case goes up before the US Supreme Court. And in an eight to one decision, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes says, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And he said, better than to let them starve for their imbecility, uh, that society can prevent these kind of people from continuing their kind. He actually compares vaccination laws to, quote, snipping the fallopian tube. And what this does in the United States, the first eugenics law was passed in Indiana around 1906, 1907. This is 20 years later. But what this does is it just creates like a fire of eugenics in the United States. For any of you from the Midwest and from these states that have uh, fair state fairs where you bid on a pie or you bid on a pig or a goat, well, you know, people in the United States used to bid on, you know, who had the bluest eyes the blonde hair. And you can go online to the Library of Congress and actually see the buildings, these fitter family contest buildings where people would show up with their whole families to be bid upon who's the whitest, blondest, et cetera. Germany ends up adopting this law that the US Supreme Court says is legitimate. And at a certain point, US Congress members say, the Germans are beating us at our own game. We must amp it up. And so the US does, and states competed for having the most people sterilized. And it's important to put this in context. Bad enough if we were talking about adults, but in the state of Virginia and elsewhere, they're sterilizing kids that are 10, 11, and 12 years old. Yeah, as recently as the 1970s. I mean, I, as a reporter, went to North Carolina and met oh, individuals yes. who are still alive. Elaine who Riddick, were, yeah. yeah who, who were sterilized. Justice Ginsburg represented one of them who's still alive. Mm -hmm. Niall Ruth Cox. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's really interesting about both Indiana provisions is that they were state laws that were passed with a desire not to address a specific need, you might say, but to tell a particular story about abortion in a way that redirects from a women's rights question, a health question, but tells a story that says that there is uh, disrespect for fetal life, there is uh, an insufficient consideration of the rights of fetuses. So, so I, I tend to think about, you know, there's so many different state level laws, and we'll definitely get into more of them, but that these laws, they're not addressing an epidemic of sex selective abortion. Um, or that people are aborting because, because their child is, they suddenly dis discovered if they're white that their child is Asian. I, like, this is not why people right. are terminating right. but, pregnancies. But you, you even know. have, I mean, the political fault lines involved in this, you have Bernie Sanders asked by Chuck Todd about sex selective abortions, and he says, that's a problem, we have to look at it. It is, frankly, a political trap. But at the same time, and, and, and there's been a lot of, as you know, really important reproductive justice. But can, 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 but yeah. can I just, just say something right here, which yeah. I, I find really important because today, you know, there's, there's so much that people don't know. People are actually confused about global warming and climate change. I mean, we know it exists, but because there's been so much fuzziness around, people wonder, oh my gosh, there was snow this year. Maybe there's really no global warming, right? Yeah. And the same is true in health spaces. So here are a couple things that I find really important to talk about and just get out of the way. The first thing is that we know it's empirically true and shown over and over again that a woman is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term. Right? That is nothing to do with her poverty. A 
pregnancy is a parasite to a woman's body, which is why women menstruate. So it's really important. Pregnancy, 14 times more likely to die. For those of us who choose compared to, to an become abortion. Compared, compared to, to an abortion. abortion. Yeah. An abortion is one of the safest procedures a woman can have at all. An abortion is safer than a colonoscopy. An abortion is safer than getting a penicillin shot. I say that because it's just important to lay the ground in terms of medical fact, right? It is just important before we go elsewhere and to think about it in, in that context, right? So if we know that and we do, you'd imagine that a government might say, my gosh, you know, if there's a procedure, if there's this thing there, you're 14 times more likely to die if you did it. Think really carefully about that. Why wouldn't you do the other? Right? It's important. The other thing that I think is important in these contexts, a lot of people think, well, abortion was always illegal, and then come these feminists, and these feminists, no. Abortion was legal in the United States. Abortion was legal in the United States up until around the time of the Civil War. And then you might add, you wonder, well, what happens around the time of the Civil War where abortion begins to get politicized? And if you look at the AMA, you look at the works of Horatio Storer, Joseph DeLee, what you come to discover are a couple of things. The first is that prior to that time, women controlled nearly 100% of women's reproductive health care. About half of those women were black, they were native women, and they were white women. They did abortions, they did pregnancy, they did whatever it was that they did. At the rise of gynecology and obstetrics, meaning when medical schools began to take on these spaces, medical schools excluded women, so these were professions that men could go into. Now you read the books, which really were kind of like substantive pamphlets that these guys wrote, and they start talking about, we're not just like those women, and they're really concerned about men comparing them to these women, these midwives, and they try to distinguish themselves. This isn't just women's work that they're doing, and they work actively to get these women out. We go from about 100% of women's reproductive health care being done by women to about 1% by the turn of the century. They're effective at getting women out. And one of their strategies is to use abortion. They say that one, midwives are dirty. Midwives had better success rates with keeping women alive after pregnancy than doctors did. This is a fact. You can look it up. You can read my work, right? <laughs> Um, so, so that's the case. Women are, you know, barred from medical schools and whatnot. And there are campaigns that are used to criminalize midwives and also abortion. And one other interesting point that's relevant here is that these guys write about how white women are needed to, quote, spread their loins and go west, south, and north. They also lead anti-immigration campaigns. And if you think about that time, and compare it to this time, you see a lot of things that are actually in common. Anti-immigration campaigns, questions about do women really have the capacity to make their own decisions in this space and whatnot. I'm only sharing that as historical information. People can decide what they want to do with their own bodies, but I think we need to correct the record in terms of the misconception that the pilgrims were not practicing abortions. Oh, yes, they were. Right, and if we're thinking about what was, what was the case at the founding, Abortion was legal at the case of the founding. The, the abortion was legal at the case of the founding. Yeah. And when abortion, and it's very interesting to note, the time in which abortion becomes illegal, it's also very interesting to mark uh, courts' responses to women. And they're fascinating. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the cases, Bradwell v. Illinois. Bradwell v. Illinois is a case in the late 1800s. It's a case where a woman has gone to law school and she wants to become a lawyer. Only the state of Illinois doesn't allow women to become licensed lawyers. Her case goes before the US Supreme Court. And this is after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, equality and all of that, equal opportunity. And the court doesn't apply this to Bradwell. Instead, the court treats her like she's a donut or something and says, you know, because you're so delicate, um, you know, that you lack reason, that, you know, women are better off in the home taking care of their children. Women aren't suited for reason. 
And I find it very interesting in these spaces, these are not you know, iterations that are biblical that we're dealing with. These are iterations that come from our court that situate women in these spaces. Yes, it's interesting. I th is it Bradwell versus Illinois that has the quote where it says that this is the, this is the law of the creator? Yes. And then I always like to quote Justice Ginsburg's response to that in one of her briefs in the 1970s. She said, the method of communication between the creator and the jurist has not yet been disclosed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. So, you know, so yeah. but, but I, I just, before we move on from the eugenics piece, I think one of, one of the things that Clarence Thomas was doing that was very clever is drawing on a real history that existed with some women's rights advocates making common cause, the cause of reproductive control for women's rights reasons, so, and, you know, and uh, the cause for eugenics yes. having intersected in these ways. And he specifically talks about Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. And you know, it was, it's a, it, there is not a lot of nuance in this subject, but we need a lot of nuance well, to take it, into account. I think it's really important that we're clear about our histories, right? And the reality is that, you know, there has been racism and white supremacy that's been practiced by white women, right? I mean, this is not just a white male enterprise, and that's important for us to put on the table. And it's actually true that there were suffragettes who only wanted voting rights for white women and told black women, get to the back of the bus. Quite literally, you're not a part of our movement. And there were suffragettes uh, who were supporters of eugenics in the United States. It's a class-based practice. So all of those things, you know, happen to be true. Um, they're part of knitting what our history is all about. So when Clarence Thomas relates this history, as I say, which could really be an essay, you know, he's on point with quoting uh, some of what he quotes in terms of what that history uh, was about. With Margaret Sanger, it is a complicated history. Um, and let's complicate it even further. 1966. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. receives Planned Parenthood's first big award. It's their inaugural Margaret Sanger Award. Now, he was not able to receive it in person, and his wife, Coretta Scott King, receives it on his behalf. And it is a really moving speech that he writes and how he says that, in King's words, that, um, that Sanger's movement is one that he could relate to. He says that nothing's more cruel than to bring a child into this world that is not wanted. He said it was easy to understand what a women's reproductive rights movement was because of the tragic, horrific ways in which black women had to forge their own beings in this society. He said what could be worse than people, families, that came from agrarian economies where it was normal to have 10 kids, but to try to shove those 10 kids inside of a one bedroom tenement. And it's a very powerful and very moving speech that King gives in um, appreciation for actually getting this award. And before heads explode with that, it's just important to, to also say that Prescott Bush, the father of George H.W. Bush, was actually the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. So to put all of that uh, in context in terms of where we are yes. uh, today. And I think his nickname in Congress was Rubbers. That was George H.W. Yeah. And, and to put also a little bit more in context before we move on, Title 10, which is now on the chopping block, Title 10 provides reproductive health care services for the poorest of Americans. So when we hear things about poor Americans being able to get STD screenings or poor women being able to get breast cancer screenings, this is Title 10 funds that provide that. Well, who shepherded that law through Congress? George H.W. Bush. And who signed that into law? Richard Nixon. And it's being dismantled right now. That helps to put these times into context, right. I think. And, and who was it that authored Roe v. Wade? Yes. Republican appointees. This was a 7-2 seven -two decision. 7-2 seven -two decision. So let's, let's get right into it, because these let's Indiana... Do. These, As if we yeah. haven't already. I yeah, think no, that people I mean, in the audience are like, oh, we well, have. Well, the thing is that the... OK, so you mentioned that the Indiana law is among hundreds of laws that are dancing around the central question of the abortion right. And that's a strategic... That's a strategic argument, right? They are trying to pass these laws to chip away at Roe v. Wade. 
However, Justice Anthony Kennedy retired about a year ago. We all know what happened since then. The court has realigned. In your Kavanaugh. view, where Kavanaugh? Uh, where are we leading? Where, where's this all leading? So are we leading to a full repeal, full abortion ban? Okay, so if, so if I could back up again, yes. right? You guys are probably thinking, like, when, when will Goodwin stop backing up? But I think that we these, to, you know, historical analyses are, are, are really important. So, you know, the, the times that we're in, you know, are also matched by other things happening around us. So between 2010 and 2013, there are more state level anti abortion, anti contraception laws that are proposed and enacted than in the 30 years prior combined. A whole lot of activity during that time. You say, well, what happened in 2010? It's the rise of the Tea Party that comes into, into office. And at the same time, there's a lot of um, you know, legislating about immigration. There's a lot of legislating about voter ID laws, right? If we see this as just in an isolation, it's just about abortion, it's not just about abortion. And it's happening in state houses, it's happening it's in the happening US in, It's happening in, yeah, you know, during that. So we have to have the kind of conversations that add further nuance to this. And so these targeted regulations is what you've been talking about in Texas and all over the country. And what these have sought to do is to make it much more difficult for a person to be able to end a pregnancy, right? And so we've already talked about how safe an abortion actually is. But some of these laws have said, well, OK, you must retrofit your clinics so that they look like hospital emergency units. You don't even need that. And said, well, doctors must have admitting privileges. And you know, from the outset, that sounds kind of smart. Like, well, shouldn't doctors have you know hospital admitting privileges? But that's really cumbersome. And it turns out there are already federal laws that provide, in any case of emergency, a hospital must admit you. There are these laws about how high you know your cabinets must be how wide the hallways must be, all of these kinds of things as a means of trying to chip away at uh, an abortion right. And in some ways, they've been quite successful. So we had just, it was 2016 that the court said, you can't do this, you can't pass Whole regulations. Yeah. You can't pass regulations in the name of protecting women's health if you can't show that they actually improve women's health and certainly not if they create an undue burden on accessing abortion. That's right. But, yeah. but we also have Justice Breyer issuing these Cassandra-like warnings saying that the court is ready to uh, overturn precedent. And in that, he had a parenthetical where he referred to the uh, major abortion case. Planned Are you talking about Thomas? Casey. Not Breyer. No, no, Breyer. Breyer. Breyer, yeah. In a totally unrelated to abortion dissent, he said this court is far too quick to overturn uh, precedents. And in a parenthetical, right. he cited Planned Parenthood versus Casey. He seems to be sending us a message. Uh, the court has already been asked to hear uh, from the Fifth Circuit a Louisiana version of the law that, to me, is practically identical from the Texas law. So how ready do you think the Supreme Court is to go back even just to this precedent of 2016 now that it's newly constituted? So my sense is that the court is differently compromised, uh, how it's comprised, and one might say compromised. <laughs> uh, that was a slip of the Right, right. So it's a different court. But let's be clear. So Justice Roberts has said, you know, there are no such things as uh, Trump justices, as Obama justices, et cetera. You know, there are members of the court, uh, Justice Roberts being one, who care about their legacy, right? Um, and so there won't be, in my opinion, the kind of one case that does away with uh, abortion access and rights. Instead, there will be the kind of chipping away as we see with the kinds of legislation leading to the kinds of cases that are now making their way through uh, the court. If you think about the Alabama law, which has been on a lot of people's minds, it's the law that, um, that it's, they're called the heartbeat bills and you know bans abortion after a certain period of time. Or total bans in the case and of total Alabama. Bans, exactly, and with no exceptions for rape or incest. Strategically, that's very interesting because if you were saying, okay, where's the point of compromise, right? Then it might be, okay, you'll compromise to rape and incest. No abortion except if it's a circumstance 
of rape and incest, right? Might that be the kind of case uh, that the court is uh, open to? I think not, but one of the things that you said is that right after Whole Woman's Health, the 2016 decision that struck down two Texas laws, what was very interesting was that across the country, something that virtually never happened is that state legislatures were proposing the same legislation that the Supreme Court had just struck down. Mm -hmm. That never really happens, right? right? The Supreme Court says, you know, no more blue, and states aren't, you know, enacting laws that say, give us more blue. They've that's already why we're heard. Both orange right now. Right, that, that's right. No more orange, right? Then they're not proposing more yeah. orange, right? But after, you can say, well, well, why is this? Well, one of the things that it does is it keeps those who are interested in women's rights, women's reproductive health rights, spending a lot of money hmm. and spending their wills over and over uh, again. And it's laying the groundwork for a situation that we're in right now, right? Which is that the court could change. Well, and, and and I think what what you describe, you know, about the Trump justices versus the Obama justices, what we're seeing right now, I think, represents different interpretations of what it might mean that we now have more Trump justices. So these total bans have existed for a very long time. These ones at the state level that are now capturing a lot of attention, but rarely were they signed into law, although they have been. But since Trump won, you actually have state legislators talking about how they feel emboldened to, to lay this kind of groundwork because they assume. Uh, that they will be able to get the court to uphold a ban. Now, one thing I, I want to make sure before we go to questions to ask you about is, you know, during the time that everybody was very uh, closely paying attention to laws like the ones passed in Alabama and Georgia, uh, there was a lot of attention to this question about should these laws go into effect? Will there be prosecution of individuals who seek abortions? Um, and in some of these laws, there are specific exclusions. In others, there are not. Uh, there was a particular concern about Georgia's. And I, I know you've done a lot of work on this. We've been talking about the realm of constitutional law, but there's an entirely other realm in <laughs> which pregnancy. There's law, constitutional law, property pregnant, contracts. Towards. Criminal, yes. Criminal. Well, OK, so, 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 so <laughs> well, how is that story incomplete? Well, all of this is very incomplete. So my forthcoming book, Policing the Womb, I, actually, I tried to write a book about this that actually didn't deal with abortion because there's so much more other than abortion that folks should be concerned about, right? The Marlies Munoz case, that there are state laws that override a pregnant woman's medical directive. So your medical directive is fine. Do not resuscitate, except if you turn out to, if you turn to be pregnant. In Marlies's case, 14 weeks pregnant, uh, she has a brain aneurysm. Her husband and her parents say, okay, no resuscitation. She was an EMT, emergency medical technician. Fine, no. Texas has a law that overrides your medical directive if you're pregnant. And so in her case, they intubated her, tracheated her at a certain point, and they put her, also she could gestate this fetus, they put her on a bed that would shake like this so that she wouldn't get bed sores, but that caused her eyes to flip open and shut. And so then the state taped her eyes shut and through, their, through doctors, so she's on a shaking bed, eyes taped, so that she could gestate this fetus. This goes on for 62 days before they're able to finally get a victory in court to you know, take the tubes away and to basically unplug this body. What her father says is she's no longer like my daughter. This is a corpse. And she was. She was rotting. Her skin was no longer soft, smooth, and warm. It hardened. Her father said she was like a mannequin. And this is what happens when you are brain dead and your organs begin to shut down. Or cases like In Re AC in DC, where a woman is diagnosed with uh, cancer, she wants chemotherapy. Her doctors say no, because you're gestating a fetus. They get a court order to remove the fetus. It dies in two hours, and she dies in two days, never receiving the medical care that she wanted. Or Wisconsin, which in the 1980s passed the euphemistic crack baby mama's law that provided that for any reason a doctor could recommend the forced incarceration of a woman for the protection of her fetus. In Alicia Beltran's case, just a couple years ago, um, she was incarcerated civilly for over 70 days. Her doctors did so because she told them that she used to have a problem with prescription medications. 
She had tested clean in her prenatal visit, no alcohol, no drugs, but just the fact that she admitted that at an earlier time in her life she was on prescription meds was sufficient for the state of Wisconsin to incarcerate her. No lawyer for this woman. Lawyers provided for her fetus, but not for her. Over 70 days incarcerated. And when she got out, she had lost her housing, had lost her job. And how was she going to take care of the kid? Right? So all of these kinds of things in Alabama, right? Over 500 women, and most of them white, just in the last few years, taking plea deals under Alabama's fetal endangerment law, which was a law that was never intended for pregnant women. It was actually a law that was enacted to try to discourage guys from turning their homes into meth labs and those potentially blowing up and killing the kids who were in the home. And instead, these laws have now been directed at pregnant women. And I could tell you about Bebe Shui, prosecuted for first degree murder in Indiana just because she tried to kill herself. Or women being arrested because they fell down steps and doctors interpreting, ah, oh, well, maybe she was attempting to try to commit an abortion by falling down the steps. There's a lot of hysteria. There have even been legislators that have proposed the death penalty for women who harm their pregnancies. You can't make up these times. So far away from abortion, there are so many other things to be concerned about in terms of the policing of women's bodies, the criminal prosecution of women, and how this is all happening. And before we turn back, I have to say that black women, black and brown women, were truly the canaries in the coal mine. And here's what I'll say about this. The women's movement, women's reproductive health rights movement, in some ways, have contributed to the moment that we're in. And let me explain that. In the 1980s and 90s, when black women were being dragged out of hospitals in bloodied gowns and chains, these are women who were trying to have their babies these are women who suffered from some forms of addiction, but they wanted to be pregnant. They wanted to do the best that they could, which is why they chose to get prenatal care. And they went to hospitals where doctors and nurses collaborated with police and prosecutors and turned over their confidential patient records. Medical University of South Carolina, dozens of black women dragged out of that hospital, giving birth on concrete floors and jails and in toilet prisons. These women were not thought of as the poster children, the poster women for reproductive health and rights. And so that happened, and it continued to happen. And now it's really catching up with white women. And I think it's horrifically sad. All of that is it's inhumane at the very least of it, and that's when we're not even talking about abortion rights. We're just talking about basic human dignity. Wow. Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's separate from abortion rights. No, way, it's not, right? it no. To do with, it has to do with how to, in your words, police the womb, whether that's, uh, whether that's in the context of not wanting to be pregnant or wanting to be. And you know, to that point, let's be clear about something else that we haven't talked about, uh, which is maternal mortality. The United States, according to CIA data, and this is not some fringe women's group, I'm talking about the Central Intelligence Agency. If you go to their website, they list by country safety of pregnancy. The US ranks around 50th, 51st in the world. Ahead of the United States, where it would be safer to give birth, Bosnia, a country that was formerly war-torn, torn, uh, Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, we're way behind those that we say are our allies, like you know the UK, France, Germany, et cetera. We're way behind those countries. It's safer to be in a developing country and give birth than it is to be in the United States. In many instances, we're 51st in the world, so you can do the math. And what does this mean? Many of the very states where we see these anti-abortion laws come up are the various states where it's the deadliest to actually carry a pregnancy to term. Many of you may not know, but Texas, empirically, is considered the deadliest place in the developed world to have a pregnancy and to give birth, right? And when you think about it, Whole Woman's Health, that 2016 decision that we were just talking about, this is based out of Texas law. Right? So when you, you think about it, you know, this kind of movement, let's chip away, chip away, chip away at abortion. Well, guess 
where women receive their reproductive health care. The very places that are providing the opportunity for a woman to terminate her pregnancy are also the places where a woman would go to for a reproductive health care. And if those places shut down, then where is a woman going for her prenatal health care? Because the states like Texas and Alabama and whatnot, they're not building new clinics. They're not building new places for women to go to protect their pregnancies. Not at all. When those clinics go, it turns out that poor women have virtually no place to go to take care of their pregnancies. We're going to go to questions shortly. I just have one more question for you, which okay. is uh, specifically about the Affordable Care Act. Um, we've been talking about whether the Supreme Court is willing to go back on recent precedent. This is a piece of legislation that has, in various parts, been affirmed by the Supreme Court repeatedly, the, the swing vote here being Chief Justice John Roberts. Um, now we have coming up through multiple challenges, one challenging the entire Affordable Care Act, the other, uh, the other is in the form of regulations yes. that are promulgated by the Trump administration. So just briefly, because I, I do want to get some questions from the audience, what are the prospects? What should we be thinking about as we look at these challenges? You know, quoting Dr. King again, you know, Dr. King said of all of the injustices, lack of health care is the most inhuman, was the word that he used often. It's, it's quoted as inhumane. And that's absolutely right. Uh, we've struggled to figure out how to be humane uh, with Americans and provide health care. And what's interesting is that one of the areas in which there was agreement um, between Republicans and Democrats happened to be about pre-existing conditions. But even that now has uh, become a political hot spot. Uh, and by pre-existing conditions, it relates to this question of discrimination and with women, because one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did with its mandates is that it was in many ways lifted women from points of discrimination. Those who are more likely to be discriminated against by their insurance companies for having a pre-existing condition were women, and women had to pay higher premiums. A pre-existing condition could have been a pregnancy, and sometimes were. You know, oh, you were pregnant before, that's a pre-existing condition. Now it's going to cost more for you, and many other things. Domestic violence was a pre-existing oh, do do condition. Domestic violence even. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We could go down the, the list of that. And so these are some of the issues that are actually not given as much voice in the media as they should be. And so when we think about these challenges to the Affordable Care Act, it's really important to understand what's at stake. And even though there have been members of Congress that have laughed off, you know, why should they have to underwrite what happens with, you know, women? And of course, the response has been, you know, why do women have to underwrite Viagra, you know, and Cialis and things like that? Or you, but, were, you were once the product of a pregnancy. Oh, exactly. No, this is, this is exactly <laughs> right. Exactly. All right. On that note, <laughs> yes. Um, when, you, when you ask your question, please identify yourself and keep it short and as, in the form of a question, please. Yes. Um, so I'm Laura Lauder. Oh, sorry. And wait for the mic. I'm Laura Lauder. My question, I have a question for each of you. First to you about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's views on how Roe was decided because mm -hmm. she does have a problem with this creation of, the, of a privacy uh, uh, element of the Constitution which doesn't exist. And then f for you, my question is about if Roe is overturned and it goes to the states, many people are saying, you know what, not so bad. There will be philanthropists who provide transportation for everyone to be able to get access to abortion much more easily by going across state lines. So your thoughts. So uh, just quickly on Justice Ginsburg, you are right that she does not like Roe v. Wade. If you go and read the opinion, you will see very little about women's rights and very much about a doctor's right to practice his profession. Um, Justice Ginsburg was actually bringing a case, uh, which Professor Goodwin has written about as well, bringing a case that very same term that she hoped would form the basis of uh, the abortion right, and that was actually the case of a woman named Susan Strzok, who was a, uh, an Air Force nurse who, di who actually wanted to keep her pregnancy. But strangely enough, abortion was legal in in, military. on a military basis, <laughs> practically obligatory, and illegal in the She was given an ultimatum, actually. She was told that she could either have an abortion or leave the service, 
What she wanted to do was to use her sick leave to give birth and give the child up for adoption. And that is, in fact, what she did, but only under, uh, only under litigation. And Justice Ginsburg believed, as a, she was at that time at the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, she believed that if the first case to decide uh, an, an abortion right or reproductive freedom was a story of a woman who the state was trying to coerce her to have an abortion, then we might have a broader understanding of reproductive freedom in the guise of, in, in the realm of equality. Now, there are a lot of historians that disagree with Justice Ginsburg's broader view on Roe v. Wade, which is that she thinks that the states would have continued to legalize and that the Supreme Court went too far too fast, in addition to not liking the reasoning. My personal opinion is that most people don't know about the reasoning inside of Supreme Court cases, but what they do know is that who decides whether somebody lives or dies, frankly. These are life and death decisions for many people. People hold deeply, uh, deep and intense views on reproductive choice, whether that is in opposition or in favor. And so to me, I think the counterfactual where we have a, a Supreme Court decision that says something different, I don't think it would make a difference because I still think that these are fundamental issues that people deeply disagree about who should get to decide them. And as to your, your point about philanthropy in, in these spaces, you know, it's, it's sad because at the end of the day, what it really shows is that the freedom uh, of uh, the equality itself is one that's reserved for the wealthy and that poor people will have to rely on people of means in order to be able to access what people who are wealthier have access to. You also see that actually it really may not work. As I've said, Texas is considered the deadliest place for a woman to give birth in the United States, and Texas has prided itself on having the most robust anti-abortion laws. How has it helped women in Texas in order to be supported to go across uh, state lines? And how does it relate to the realities of people's lives? People who already have kids, most women who seek an abortion are women who actually already have kids and realize that they cannot afford to properly feed clothe and shelter the kids that they have. And so how does a woman then suspend her mothering, suspend her working, all because she got a grant that will help her in some other state? You know, it, at the end of the day, there's an important question about dignity in healthcare. And this really resonates, should resonate for all of us, but it resonates for me when I think about the fact that years ago in the United States, because of segregation, black people were denied health care services at places that served white people. And there were African Americans who died on the front steps of hospitals that refused to serve them. There's something to be said about the dignity of simply being able to get the health care that you need without having to go through various hoops and hurdles. And I, I should mention that there is, in fact, already uh, an existing apparatus that helps women travel out of state when they can't get an abortion in their state, and it's the National Network of Abortion Funds. These are local, very, very grassroots organizations that are already, they, all they do is they write checks to people who can't afford to get an abortion or who can't afford the travel for an abortion, and they exist in almost every state, including Mississippi. Um, and so it is already happening, but these, these groups are, most of them are 100% volunteer run. They have almost, at the moment that they get money, they write a check to somebody who needs it. Um, so, so that is already happening in terms of kind of patching the leaking scaffolding of our uh, existing politics. The National Network of Abortion Funds. And they have local abortion funds all over the place. Yes. Microphone. We're gonna get the mic for you. And while that's happening, I just wanna add one other thing, being a professor who teaches not only con law, but also torts, which is that, it's a very interesting time in our country in terms of instantiating embryo uh, personhood and fetal personhood, because what does it mean outside of the context of a woman? Can an embryo enter into contracts now? Um, if a clinic cryopreserves embryos and there's a storm that blows through and their generator doesn't work, uh, does this mean that a crime has been committed and that there's a series of manslaughters 
that have occurred within this space. To the extent that we have RICO laws for people who are complicit with a crime that's at the federal level, are embryos suddenly people who can then be charged with a crime because a woman has committed a felony? I ask these not to be tongue in cheek, but when you say that an embryo is a person who has the same constitutional rights and personhood as a woman, then the next logical step should be in torts, in property, in contracts, and are we willing to go there? Right? Are we willing to go there when a woman lives within a space where there's high lead and pollution? Right? Can that woman, can the embryo sue you know, the apartment managers and whatnot? And again, not tongue in cheek, but this is the reality of full personhood. This is the door we're walking this through. This is the door, yeah. and I, are we willing to walk through I just that? want to make sure we can get to one more yeah. question, because yes. we only have Four minutes left. So Catherine Moore, and the question is in yet another little area of law, in that we're talking largely about surgical abortions. And there's been a great deal of uh, progress made in the medical abortions, and right now that's in the hands of the FDA. And so that's even outside of a lot of these areas of courts of law. And there are people outside the United States who are providing mail order medical abortion to women within the United States. How is that all going to play out? Well, that's been a point of controversy, too, um, at the state level with legislators intervening in those spaces, too, making it a crime if a woman, uh, if a woman accesses and uses those prescription medications outside of the clinic space, even though in Europe women have done this for a very long uh, period of and time. And I, I do think we should define terms. Yes. Uh, so there's a potentially an aspiration abortion yes. that a doctor would need to perform, but also in many of these, in pretty much all clinics where you would go for an abortion, you also have a choice to take a series of pills that induce Two miscarriage. Pills. Right. So, uh, and, exactly. and these are these states are already regulating these. They're already saying, for example, that you can't, uh, if you live in a rural area, you can't uh, consult with a doctor through a webcam um, because that would make it more accessible. And then you have other states like California making it so that nurse practitioners are able to administer these pills uh, without needing to be doctors. But at this, yes, you do have this market it's, of people that's right. overseas I mean, sending it. Yeah, and, and again, it's a politicized space of something that actually is uh, relatively health safe and healthy for a woman to be able uh, to use and not much different than if a woman had miscarried on her own, except that the pill is helping her to be able to do so. But considerable political controversy around this space and, uh, and what Erwin Shimerinsky and I call political gerrymandering of women's reproductive health and rights. Yes, and, and you do have criminal prosecution in many states of women who are suspected to have taken these pills to end their pregnancy, including in Indiana. So even though a lot of people are proposing uh, you know, circulating access to these pills when clinics are shut down or if abortion is illegal. Legally, it is a very perilous situation for the person taking the pill. Absolutely, because it could mean criminal punishment, and especially as this has become a very vibrant area of innovation at the state level. So when you think about law, and as I teach my students, you know, I, you know, we're teaching students cases that are over 100 years old, right? Law moves slowly, but the one area, one of the few areas where law has been incredibly innovative have been about the criminal punishment of women within the re reproductive health care space. Incredibly innovative, incredibly robust. Between that period of 2010 and 2013, hundreds, hundreds of laws in this space. And if we were to pull back a little bit, because I really care about a conversation where we're talking about health, one of the things that we haven't touched on is how does this affect our kids? Right? There have been not only the rollbacks of the kinds of areas that we've talked about, but completely shutting down, and we gotta go, but completely shutting down sex education in schools across the country. And now the US has the highest rates of syphilis in the developed world, highest rates of gonorrhea, chlamydia, et cetera, amongst our kids. These are important conversations for us to have. Thank you so much for having me on the Thank stage, you. and thank you for being with us.